this. Not my spot on the floor here. She's doing something. Oh, uh, gotta go that way. Okay, so our, our uh, soul winning series today is uh, how do I win my religious friends? And, and of course, we're going to be in, in Acts, the letter to the Acts in uh, chapter, chapter 17. And I want to just pick up, kind of, we really just kind of introduced our idea or our, our topic last week. And just just started to get into it, and then of course we ran out of time. We believe started just a little bit late last week as well. Uh, Acts chapter 17, and uh, this is of course when Paul was on Mars Hill, and he was in Athens. And I did have the privilege of going there. You know the cool thing about Mars Hill; it's so rocky. There just isn't isn't very practical to build much there. So it, it's pretty much I think exactly what it would have been. Uh, in Paul's day, yeah, so it's pretty neat to stand there and look around and you know see the impressive Areopagus up on the up on the hill and all of those all of those things that are part of the were part of the setting. And right there's where Paul would have stood and should have been given six minutes. Should have been given six minutes to uh, answer the philosophers of the day who were asking him about what he was preaching. And what he was preaching that was unique to the Romans was that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so I want to read our context today. And if you can imagine kind of the setting with Mrs. Price there, of course. But <laughs> that's, that's the picture I had of Mars Hill. But I want to look at verse 16 of Acts chapter 17. And we're going to really read the context, and I want to just spend some time in this text and analyze it. Because we're asking the question, how do I reach religious people? And so let's read our text, and then we'll discuss the, the, the nuances or the, uh, the things that are unique about reaching religious people as opposed to people that aren't really anything as far as their belief. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and said, and some said, what will this babbler say? Others said, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preacheth unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine whereof Thou speakest this, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else, but either to tell or to hear some new things. Does anyone have a stopwatch on their phone? Let me get a stopwatch. Yes. What would you give me a second to pull it up? Uh, English and Greek are pretty equivalent as far as the lapse of time that it takes. You know, if you ever listen to a translator when they translate different languages, and you say something quickly in English, and then it's like, it takes a real long time in another language. Uh, English and Greek are pretty equivalent time-wise to read. Uh, actually, Greek could be even a little bit more terse than English. Okay, so you ready? I'm going to read Paul's speech, and we're going to time it real quickly. So that begins in verse 22. Will you look down to that now? All right, ready. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, 
We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, or silver, or stone, graven by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Stop. 82 seconds. 82 seconds. So one minute, 22 seconds. Now I mentioned that to say this. When they said, we're going to hear him what this babbler would say, in the Greek and Roman culture, their, uh, their custom was to have a democracy where individuals, where every person was an equal. You didn't have royalty. And the argument against the democracy was well, royalty doesn't build great strong armies. I mean, democracy doesn't build strong armies. You know, you just have a lot of people with nobody to really, you know, push them for a cause and so forth. But uh, the Greeks are very proud of their democratic society. If you look up and you see up on the on the the, the hill here, and you uh, see the the Acropolis, which is over here. And of course, there's a major stadium, a big amphitheater down to the right. And I'll be showing pictures this evening. Uh, of more of Athens and more of those uh, places in Greece. But if you have a look, you can see probably the greatest architectural feat in the world was the building of, uh, of this building here. And they built it in 15 years, the Greeks did. And uh, they would have been very, very proud of their ability to take something that normally would take more than 100 years to build. And with, with people who were commoners, you could say, uh, without slave labor. You know, a lot of times people walk by and they say, how many slaves did it take to build that? Well, none. None. Uh, they were, they were uh, citizens. So they were very proud of their society. They were very proud of their culture. And they had built this. Well, Paul, uh, in our context here, was walking around the city and he saw something and that is that he saw that there were a lot of idols. So verse 16, when Paul waited for them at Athens, speaking of Timothy and Silas, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So this is Paul's impression as he's been to the city. Now in the Greek culture, in the democracy, anyone was allowed a form. Anyone was allowed to speak. They didn't have to listen to somebody. You didn't have to listen to someone speak, so they needed to have something worthwhile saying. And the Greeks became famous orators because they did something that was unique. They would say, you can speak, but everyone that speaks gets six minutes. And of course they probably did it pretty decently and orderly as well. In other words, they went by turn and, and you know you, you had your opportunity to speak. You didn't get to speak more than six minutes and if in that six minutes time you didn't make good use of your words, they called you a babbler. And he's like a person who has bubbles floating off in the wind, just blowing bubbles. Or like a person who uh, not only blows bubbles but is like a sparrow just chirping, just, just talking because he's happy. And so when you spoke, they had what was called a bema. Now we think of bema like a throne because we talk about the bema judgment. But the bema uh, was a step. So it would be like this where you would step up. And so it was one of those things where I'm not better than you. I'm just stepping to be heard so I can be seen of, of you all. We're standing really all at the same level. You're not up on a throne. So this is the scenario when they, they called Paul in to say, we want to hear what this babbler will say. They interrupted him in one minute and 20-ish seconds. That was the point. In other words, he was allowed six minutes to preach the gospel to the Greeks at Athens. But he, in actuality, got uh, one minute and 20-something seconds. Now, there, there are some caveats to that that we'll address as we go through our text today. But I want to remind you that when we preach the gospel, that important truths that grip men, that get them to their core, to their existence, are what's important. I think I mentioned last week that Francis Schaeffer said something, this is a loose quote or a, a, a flagrant misquote maybe, but he said something about someone asking if you had one hour to uh, share the gospel with someone, how would you do it? What would be your presentation? And essentially what he said was I would take 55 minutes asking them questions to figure out what they believe and where they're coming from. And then I'd spend five minutes explaining the gospel to them based on what their understanding is, what their worldview is. 
And Paul gives a really good example of this in actually a minute and 20 seconds. Of course, what is the context for which Paul... Uh, before he delivers this message. What has he been doing as he's waiting for Timothy and Titus to come to meet him, or I mean, and Silas to meet him in, in Athens? What was he doing? What does the Bible say? Disputing with the... Before that, though, what did he do first? Verse 16, second phrase. Wait. What? Waiting. He's waiting, but what's he doing while he's waiting? Observing. He's observing. What did he observe? What did he see? The whole city was given idolatry. And then the Bible says he went into the synagogue and disputed with the Jews about it. Now, why is that significant? Well, evidently the Jews were given idolatry as well. Even the ones in the synagogue, they were given to worshiping idols. So, now Paul has this people to whom he's going to preach the gospel and he realizes that they are idol worshipers. Now, the funny thing about Athens is today uh, it, and really all of Greece really because it's just it's the first, I guess, uh, really well-developed civilization is that you can go all over town and see this building right up here. You will just see temples like this today. Just right Everywhere, these ancient buildings, a couple thousand years old, all over the city, just everywhere. And in Paul's day, he must have observed probably thousands of temples. I mean, when you're in Athens, it's like another temple. Have you ever gone to an area and there, then things about the area, the culture of the area, uh, really strike your attention? In uh, December last year, my wife and I went to a church planning conference out in Seattle. And a couple days, we went a couple days early because of the time change. We knew what it did to us last time. We got sick because of being used to getting up in the morning and then being four hours late at night. And then some, we got, I don't know, some kind of flu or something at the same time. We were susceptible to it. And when we came back, we were just so miserable because of adjusting to four hours difference there and adjusting back. It just really messes with you. I think I'd rather be on a 12-hour difference in time than a, than a four- or seven-hour time change. It's just throws you off. So we went a couple days early to orient ourselves to the time. And so we went up to Vancouver, B.C. I'd never been to Vancouver. And we drove around. We drove, I think, about 1,200 miles in a couple of days just driving around in a car and went up to through Whistler and some other places. And while we were there, come on in. Good morning. We're in Acts chapter 16. 17. Or 17. I'm sorry. Thank you, guys. Uh, while we were there, we stayed in Vancouver for the evening, and one of the things that we observed in the area we stayed in was Asian restaurants. Not one, not two, thousands. Brother Alex and Charlie, of course, they like uh, any kind of ethnic foods. Any time you can get something from another country, particularly if it's scary looking, they just really enjoy it. Uh, so, and I was thinking, Brother Alex likes pho, the Vietnamese soup, and I am telling you. The streets in Vancouver, you go, you walk down the street, and here's a Vietnamese restaurant. Next to it's 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 a Vietnamese restaurant. I left Vancouver thinking they got a lot of Vietnamese restaurants in Vancouver. A lot of Asian restaurants in general. Uh, Acts 17. So they have a lot of those, and it left me with an impression. When I think of Vancouver, you know what I think of? <laughs> Asian cuisine like everywhere, like store after store after store after store. And I would say that the people in Vancouver have nothing better to do or would rather do nothing more than go to an Asian restaurant. Uh, that's my impression of Vancouver. Now, you folks that maybe would have a more profound appreciation for the city, perhaps you uh, didn't spend hours driving around looking for a non-Asian restaurant for your wife. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> The reality of it is, is that that's my impression. Well, when Paul went to Athens, his impression was temple, 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 temple. And indeed, that impression still remains today. And then the other thing that he observed about the Greeks in Athens was that they had liked to do nothing better than, according to verse 
let's see, verse uh, 21, all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So what do they like to do? Well, they worshipped idols and they like to talk. <laughs> that, that, was, that was the impression that Paul gathered when he went to Athens. He says, you don't, you, you, I, I notice you're too, too superstitious because you have temples everywhere. Everywhere there are temples. And while he's speaking, standing here on Mars Hill, look up above. Three temples. You know, I mean, just temple, 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 temple. And idolatry was just rampant in Athens. Now, something that we don't really understand today because Athens is the capital of Greece is that Athens really wasn't a significant city as far as Greece was concerned. It was a port city and is still today. Today it's probably the most significant city in Greece, but it wasn't in that day. But what it was was a city of learning. It was an education city. It was where everyone came. When the Romans conquered the Greek Empire, uh, they didn't they didn't replace the idols. Every time in history, every time a nation was conquered, the first thing they'd do would be to either tear the temple down or tear the idol out of the temple and put their own idol in the temple to signify that their gods were greater than the other gods. And of course, the greatest god in every culture uh, would have been the ruler of the culture. He would have been believed to have been one of the, you know, a partial deity or person that had come back as a deity and so forth. And so when you conquered a nation, it was a religious conquering that you conquered a nation with. Uh, then, and we can observe more about that when we talk about Roman Catholicism because that is literally the same mindset that uh, Constantine used to conquer the world with, was, was religion, and he made the Christian Christianity, quote, the religion to conquer the world. And today, that region of the world is still conquered. Uh, by Catholicism, including including Greece. Greek is Greek Orthodoxy is the required religion. Every person in Greece is Orthodox. You're born Orthodox. And they say, well, what if you're Muslim? Well, there's a very very small percentage of Muslims. And it, at, when the Turks conquered Greece, it was entirely Muslim. And of course, their temples were uh, were made to be uh, mosques. And then when the uh, Catholics won, then they made the temples, uh, a, they made the, the temples uh, Catholic churches and put their gods in them and their icons in them instead. And so now today they're going back, they, they're going back to the original, and so they're, the original gods that the temples were built for is what they're putting back in them. And it's really interesting, that progression. That's the mindset. That's the way the people think. Okay, so now Paul wants to win the Athenians. The first thing Paul does is observes them, gets to know them and their thinking and their mindset. And there's two things that we see about their mindset, that they are wholly given to idolatry. Wholly given to idolatry. I mean, they're big into idols. And they're interested in Paul for the very same reason, because he's telling them about the resurrection of the dead, and that's new. And that has an attraction to them because, what are they like? Something new. They like. They they did nothing better to do than to hear or learn about a new thing. That's what they did. <laughs> this is mean. Don't. It's it's just an, it's an observation, but it's tragic to me that a country with the natural resources of Greece today is just about the same as it was in that day. In other words. Uh, Tourism is the industry in Greek, in Greece, where they talk about the Greek heritage. Of course, the people group are not the original Greeks, but they are Greeks by assimilation. They have claimed they've they've culturally become Greek. And uh, Athens is still very much a city of learning and talking about things, but it has a great population, great refugee population, very very terrible economy, and um, no industry except for stone. They, they sell their stone. They have a lot of marble there. So there's still the marble industry. But the country is probably the most fertile country in the world. You just Anything grows there. And agriculturally, uh, there's just nothing like it as far as how beautiful and fertile it is. But 
you know, I, I remember asking several of the Greeks while I was there, so is there any industry here? Did, have, have the Greeks ever built automobiles? No. Ever built machinery? No. Do they have ore? Do they have resources? Oh yeah, we have a lot of natural ore, a lot of natural resources. They don't make anything. What do they do? They talk. In other words, they, they talk philosophy. They're philosophers. And still, the culture, uh, had that, that culture has influenced every group that settled Greece even till today, so it would still be very true today. Uh, now, Paul has the opportunity now. He's very, very limited on his time. He has how much time legally? Six, six, six minutes. Six minutes, and how much time until they interrupted him? Two minutes and 20 seconds. One minute and 20 seconds. Oh, one, minute. one minute and 20 seconds. So he only got one minute and 20 seconds to speak. Of course, I've spoken about Paul speaking a great deal more than that because he had some great content. So the first thing he did uh, in verse 17, he's, he's therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So, they like to talk, they like to reason, they like to argue. People that, uh, you know, this is a, there's a problem in our culture today, and, and the Greeks didn't have this problem. You know, people today don't like to be challenged. They don't allow a challenge. Uh, they, people, people don't like to talk about, you know, we have the whole, don't talk about what? What things? Religion. Religion and politics. And even today, it's amazing to me uh, how much politics is, is people's religion. It really is. It's, uh, and how much religion is an untouchable. It's like connected to the core of a person's beliefs. And people don't want to have their beliefs shaken or challenged. They don't want their beliefs rattled. Friend, that is the beauty of light. That's the beauty of truth. Light dispels darkness. Light sheds. It shows flaws. It shows things that are wrong. And as a believer, you don't have to be afraid of the light. You oughtn't to be afraid of the light. If you can't stand to have somebody talk about your religion, you can't stand to have your religion challenged, can I say to you that that ought to be a matter for concern because probably in your heart you know there's some untruth. I'm concerned with believers that defend their faith uh, by getting angry. And you, if you can't talk about Bible doctrine, with, so I can understand getting enthusiastic about the great doctrines, the great truths that, that uh, come from our God, who's a great God. I can understand being enthusiastic, and I think enthusiasm merits the raising of a voice. But if you can't have your belief in Jesus challenged, you can't have somebody challenge the person of Christ or the virgin birth. You say, Pastor, somebody shouldn't challenge that. Why not? What if it isn't true? What if it isn't true? I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to spend my life believing in something that's not true. Do you? You know, Jesus, my friend, proved that He was God. He allowed Himself to be challenged. And He proved who He was. The miracles Jesus did proved He was God. Did everybody believe in Him? No. But the evidence was there. Why did people not believe in Him? Well, because of they were rooted in their beliefs. They didn't want their beliefs challenged. Now, can I say that anytime you share the Gospel, the reality is that there will be individuals who aren't open to truth. And I think that's a good starting point for us as believers. Challenge people to be open first. Challenge them on saying, you know what? Uh, one of the first questions I ask when somebody says, well, I'm Catholic. And I say, well, how'd you get to be one? How'd you get to be a Catholic? It's a good question. I'm Muslim. How'd you get to be a Muslim? I'm Orthodox. How'd you get to be Orthodox? How'd you get to be that? Well, you know the answer, don't you? They have... A few videos of a few converts. Will for converts. Do you know how people get to be Catholic? If you're Catholic, don't get mad at me. If you're, if you're Catholic, don't get mad at me. Check it out. Find out if it's so. How do you get to be Catholic? How did Rome become a Catholic country? With a sword. That's how Rome became a Catholic country. 
<laughs> you are now, you know, Constantine saw a cross in the sky that said, in this sign conquer. And he had recognized that the reality of Christianity was so great that every time you killed a Christian, every time you, you fed them to the lions, people would watch the spectacle from the stadium and as they watched people die, being fed to the lions, singing with God's grace, they said, you know, that's, there's something to people being willing. They could walk out if they would just renounce their faith in Jesus. There's something to believing something enough to die for it. And there's something to believing that you have life after death that really resonates with something God put in me. And every time you killed a Christian, ten would walk out. Ten more would, would rise from a stadium and walk out believers. And you just can't win a battle that way. You decide, we're going to stamp Christianity out of our empire, and every time you kill a Christian, you, you have ten replace him. The math doesn't add up. And so Tertullian said that the blood of the martyrs, when he's writing the history of it, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Constantine realized that, and he was the first emperor, not the first emperor to not persecute Christians, but he was the first emperor to be wise enough to realize if I persecute the Christians, there's no way to win. So first he stopped persecuting them, and then secondly, he politicized Christianity. He made Christianity the state religion. And every Roman and a large part of the culture, of course, being Greek, every Roman became universal Christian, Catholic Christian. That's where Catholicism came from. Okay, now how many Catholics have been forced into Catholicism today? Well, in the United States of America, nobody is forcefully converted into Catholicism, unless you're a baby. Yes, ma'am. It used to be if you wanted to get married to someone who was in the church, you mm -hmm. had to join. You had to join the church. So sure. that would be forced if you wanted to get married. Sure. I had a friend that I that I worked with, and you know he had the, a similar issue uh, that that uh, he wasn't he wasn't Christian, he wasn't Catholic, but he became Catholic because of his marriage, and uh, he didn't think a lot of Catholicism subsequently, but he was token Catholic, and uh, that that that's true. Uh, you get to be a Catholic when you're baptized as a baby. Yeah. Your parents baptize you as a baby. And now here's the kicker, though. Here's the deal. In the United States, we don't have a state tax to the Catholic Church. But in Catholic European countries, there is one. And in the Orthodox Church, the same would be true. And so based on your population of your city, for instance, in Greece, it determines how many churches that they get, and the government pays for the churches. You get this many churches quote and that's your church and you can't have a funeral unless you have a funeral in the orthodox church and so if you become one of the one percent of evangelicals or whatever you can't get buried in greece uh, if you leave the catholic the orthodox church it's still your family uh has to renounce you there's still all kinds of things that that uh are along with that. Now, religion does whatever it's allowed to do in the country that it can get away with. And the United States, being a, a country that was established as a country believing in God, where people are able to exercise free worship, it didn't start that way. We fought for that. That became one of the establishing principles of our country. We don't understand that very well. And you don't understand very well what a lot of missionaries go through when they go to a country where if a person becomes a believer in Jesus, you can't be an honest believer in Jesus. You can be a believer in Jesus, but that whole secretly, we're going to look at that in John 10 this morning in, in our message, but secretly believing in Jesus is not the prescription that He prescribed, is it? We're supposed to go and teach all nations. So we don't become part of a religion uh, and then also believe in Jesus. It's Jesus instead of religion. And so it's not, not culturally very acceptable. All right. Now that's a pretty big caveat, but I want us to understand when you're talking to someone who's religious, one of the first things that you ask someone who's Muslim or Catholic or whatever their religion is, how did you become religious? How did you become part of your... your you want to debate your religion. Sometimes people don't want to debate their religion, but I'm challenging your religion, you could put it that way. Now you don't get to just challenge somebody's religion, do you? very easily, do you? There needs to be to a degree a rapport. 
Uh, but Paul didn't always have the rapport. But where did he have the best rapport? With the Jews. <laughs> With the Jews. He would have grown up in Tarsus, a sister city of learning. Athens would have been the college city, would have been the educated, the philosophical city, and Tarsus would have been the equivalent of it. And so Saul would have grown up knowing, hearing and learning the Greek philosophers, and he's probably, they think, being Jewish and a Benjamite, his father had probably purchased his own citizenship and Paul's as well. Uh, or Paul would have gotten his citizenship by being the son of a father who had purchased his citizenship. And Paul knew a lot about Greek culture. One of the reasons why in Acts chapter 9 when Paul got saved, he was going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Because he understood the way they thought. Understood Gentiles. By the way, let me just say this. Paul was a terrible, a terrible apostle to the Jews. Now, I don't mean a terrible person. I don't mean he did anything wrong. But every time Paul tried to preach the gospel to the Jews, they're the ones that tried to kill him. He was not an effective apostle to the Jews. Matter of fact, it happened right here. He went into the synagogue because he's Jewish. It's what he knows. It's who he has a relationship with. If you're Jewish, you instantly have a relationship with Jews. You had a, in, in Athens, there's a place that Saul belonged or had a right to, and that was the synagogue, the gathering place for Jewish people. So that's where we find. And he, the Bible says he disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews... And then and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. And so now we see them that met with him. So people came to hear Paul. He's in the market and he did. People, who are you? Well, I'm Saul from Tarsus, but I'll tell you who I really am. I, I'm a believer in Jesus and I, am a, I have eternal life and I'm resurrected from the dead. Well, I like to hear about that. And so he started having meetings in the marketplace in the Agora. And you can still see that place today where that would have been. And so he's meeting with them in the marketplace and he's meeting in the synagogue with the Jews and he's, he's establishing a rapport with the people and as he does so, hear me now, he meets opposition. Now listen to this. You ask the question, how do I reach my religious friends? And the answer is build a rapport with them. And the answer is challenge them to be open-minded. Would you be open-minded? Would you consider the gravity why is it that back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, when uh, Christians were teaching soul winning in the churches and being pretty effective at it, that the first question they taught people to ask was, if you were to die today, are you sure you'd be in heaven? Yeah, do you know whether or not you'd be in heaven? James Kennedy started And that. No, he didn't. Nope. He learned it from uh, D, uh, Dr. Lee Robertson. Oh, okay. And uh, that's where he got all his soul winning, uh, his uh, evangelism explosion. Okay. He... Uh, plagiarized Lee Robertson. <laughs> okay. He lived in Chattanooga and they were friends. And But he, re he turned, the, uh, turned the Presbyterian church upside down by preaching the gospel that way. But that was the question that everybody asked was, if you die today, do you know for sure whether or not you'd be in heaven? And that's the challenging people's beliefs or challenging them to be open-minded. And here's the deal. Now, you don't want to be a robot when you go to somebody's door. I don't, I don't say that because I just think it's robotic and I think most people have heard it before and it just makes them think you're just quoting a speech or you've been taught like Jehovah's Witnesses how to debate or to argue with people. But you're not really having a person-to-person -person conversation where you're actually thinking and using your brain. And it's where you've just been taught, say this, say this, say this. And you don't want to say this gospel presentation. Now, but there are ideas, things that you need to get open. Here's what I ask people, I'll ask someone, are you open-minded? Would you consider yourself to be an open-minded person where you would consider whether something is true or false? Because that really is what it comes down to. If you're open-minded, you're challenging a person to be willing to be challenged, first of all. And I think that's a good starting point. Would you consider being willing to have your Religious system challenge. Now, if someone asked me that question, you know what my answer would be? Sure. Because I know that what I believe is true. And I know that it will stand the scrutiny of the test. There are people today that you try to tell them, can I tell you about Jesus? And they say, well, I don't even believe Jesus ever existed. Well, do you think that Jesus could stand the challenge for existence? Let's just examine that very, very briefly. There are churches established 
on every corner of the world. And we're going to start one in space here pretty soon. I'm going to propose it to Elon Musk. <laughs> there are churches in every corner of the world. Jesus probably existed. Right? Does that make sense to you? Uh, people died for their faith because they believed in Jesus. Jesus probably exists. You say, well, Pastor, there are, there are idols in every corner of the world. Yeah, yeah. Good and evil both exist. But we're, we're challenging the existence, not whether Jesus is God, whether He's the only way, whether He's a Christ, whether there's resurrection from the dead. We're challenging whether the existence of Jesus. You know, a lot of people are just so brainwashed that they believe... They believe evolution so much that they don't even believe in the existence of Jesus. They believe in, in a theory for the creation of the world so much today that that was concocted less than 200 years ago. Literally, the theory of evolution was invented less than 200 years ago and it's so much the predominant view of people that they are willing to just wipe out any evidence for the flood or for... They just, just ignore all kinds of evidence in the same way that they ignore the existence of Jesus Christ. Do you know that today in our culture, Paul didn't have to deal with whether or not people believed in a God or believed in a Creator. He didn't have to deal with that. Today we have to deal with whether or not we're even created or whether you know a dot smaller than a period on a page had all the matter in the universe and exploded and, and uh, here we are today. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? But that's where we're at. Okay? Uh, the person of Christ, whether Jesus is the Son of God, whether Jesus did miracles, whether Jesus is born of a virgin. Now, there are some folks that that's not challenged. If you're, if you're sharing the Gospel and you're concerned about your family member who is Roman Catholic, well, they believe that God created the world. They mostly all believe in evolution as well. They believe that God created the world. And... They believe that Jesus is God. They believe that Jesus died on the cross, that He died for sin. They believe a lot of things. The only problem is, is that because of Romanism, they believe things in addition to that. In other words, the church is the door to eternal life, not Jesus. And that's the problem with it. You say it's not an individual uh, relating to God. You go through the church. Uh, to relate to God. And they'll tell you they believe everything the same as we do. They believe in being born again, but they mean something different by it. They believe in, uh, they believe that Jesus is the only way, but only doesn't mean only. And so on and so forth. And so you have to, by the way, I think we should show, uh, maybe we'll do it next Sunday. I'd like to show an interview that I did a few years ago uh, with the Roman Catholic priest. I'd like to show that in Sunday school, uh, probably next Sunday morning. Okay, now, that clock can't be right. i got to figure out what's right. I think our um, atomic clock has failed. i got to have four minutes. I want to move forward. And I want to look at Paul's message. Now, here, of course, would be orthodoxy. And I showed this sad picture last week. It's blurry because you weren't really supposed to go into the auditorium and take pictures. And I made sure this man's back was turned so that you know, I didn't take a picture of his face, but he had been kissing the icons on the wall, and then he kissed something in the box there. And over here is this is uh, this is in Meteora, uh, and this is this is a monastery on the top of a rock. And this is this has the skull of a saint, or not a saint, a uh, skull of of a, a monk named Stephen, uh, right here in this little box. You can see a skull. And people go up. They're not allowed to kiss the skull itself anymore but they can kiss the box. Uh, that's pretty pagan, pagan feeling to me, but that's, that's orthodox religion. Uh, it's amazing that people don't even see that as a problem. They don't, they don't think that that's an issue. Uh, kissing a skull. I asked, a, I asked our tour guide, who's a strong orthodox uh, lady, I asked her, where's the rest of his body? She said, oh, it's probably just scattered around different places. They, you know, they make relics out of it, so he's got different bones and different churches and so forth. So, um, Eridus is the Sicilian or Cilician poet. I think that's a misspelling there, but I may be wrong. Cilician poet. I don't think it's Cilician. Uh, in Phenomena 5, the original line, in him we move and have our being, was pantheistic. Uh, but Paul spins this line into a statement about God as the source of life. 
Okay, so as Paul's walking around the city, he notices that they are very, very careful to have temples for every single god. And that's, that was the Romans and the Athenians. The Romans had just, they hadn't changed anything. They had changed names of gods, but they hadn't changed any of the worship of gods. And their thing was, we want to make sure to have our bases covered because if there's a god out there, uh, we want to make sure to worship him or it causes us trouble. Now, worshiping idols is a very uh, pacific. You're, you're, you're a pacifist when you worship an idol. In other words, if the god is a god of the sea and you're a seafaring individual, you want to make sure the god of the sea is not angry for something. Now, idols need something. If an idol isn't worshipped, he can't exist. Is their mindset. So these deities, if they're not worshipped, they can't exist. So they need something, but they're, they, they're going to get something. They're going, they can give something as well. So they need you to worship them, but you need to worship them as well because of what they'll do to you if you don't. And so you want to be careful, you know, worship the idol of the sea or worship the idol of agriculture or worship the idol of the seasons or worship different ones because they can really hurt you. You know, and then there's, of course, gods that represent emotions like love and, and uh, you know, and fertility and these things. And so it's very important to worship every idol. Well, the Greeks were so careful to worship idols of this Greeks in the Roman culture in Athens that they had an inscription in a temple with no idol. And the temple didn't have an idol, but it was one that was built just in case. And it was an inscription to the temple of the unknown God. The one we don't know, we don't know your name, but we're giving you a temple. And, uh, you know, if you, if you could get, if you build a temple, the idea was that the deity would come and live in the temple or live in the deity that was made representing that idol. And in that way, you could keep them caged or boxed if you worshipped them well. They wouldn't be out causing trouble somewhere. They'd be accepting their worship in that place. And so, you know, it's safer. So just in case they missed one, they had a, 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 a temple of the unknown God. Now, so what did Paul say? He said, well, you're too superstitious. You're too superstitious. You're so careful about worshiping every God that you worship the unknown God. And now, Paul uh, does something. He takes a quote that he would have been familiar with because, of course, he would have studied the Greeks himself. And so the original line in him, we move and live and have our being... It was a pantheistic line, but Paul spins a line that's about worshiping all the idols into a line about worshiping only one God. In other words, he's not saying, this is what you believe in, here's how it's the same thing I believe. A lot of apologetics today tries to tell people we believe the same thing. Uh, that's, that's pragmatism today. That's, what, that's why it's a problem. You know, uh, uh, what's his face? He's, he kind of became irrelevant. I, I'm sure he's still relevant. I just don't hear about him. Uh, you know what's his face? You know what I'm talking about? The guy that wrote 40 Days of Purpose. Um, Rick Warren. Rick Warren. That's what, you know, he's trying to connect with the Mormons and trying to connect with the Catholics and trying to connect with the Muslims. And basically his message, just like Billy Graham's was, his message is, you know, we all believe the same thing. It's all, it's all essentially the same thing. Now here's how you interpret it or how, here's how you manifest it and here's how I manifest it. And that's their apologetics. That isn't what Paul's doing. Paul is saying, here's what you say. It's not true in that context because you're too superstitious. You believe in all these gods. But the God that I'm talking about is the God that is a creator God. He made, all the, he made everything. He didn't make all the gods, but He made us. And in Him we live and move and have our being. And so He's a creator God. It isn't this pantheistic Zeus kind of a God. It's, uh, it's the, the living God, the only living God. All right, let's see if I can make this happen now. Okay, so what Paul was doing was finding common ground. He's finding common ground. Common ground is not necessarily agreement. Common ground is a place that you meet to go a direction. Let me help you understand where common ground is for believers. You will never win a person who does not believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Never. You can't be saved if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. By the way, that's why it's so important what Bible we use. That's why attacks on the Scripture that disparage the preservation of the Word of God and the inspiration of the Word of God. That's why 
That's why they don't belong. That's the danger of them. You may meet a person that doesn't understand the problem with not believing in preservation, but there's a serious problem with it. And that's why we use the Bible we use, because it reflects the, uh, it, it reflects the reality that we believe in biblical preservation. But if you don't believe in the Word of God, you'll never win someone to Jesus. There are so many people that think that Paul is up here debating without the authority of the Scripture, and he isn't doing that at all. What he's doing is saying, here's what you believe and I understand you. I know where you're coming from. And he is probably gesturing and sweeping his hands saying, you know, you've got temples everywhere here. You've even got a temple to the unknown God. But the God that we believe is a God by whom we live and move and have our being. Uh, this is Paul and his explanation. I'm going to finish with this this morning. Here's his explanation of how he preached the gospel to people. I have used none of these things. He's defending his apostleship to the church at Corinth. I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. Now, he's not speaking to lost people here. He's speaking to the church. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Paul's saying, I can have a reward if I do it willingly, but if I do it unwillingly, it's still my responsibility to preach the gospel. Uh, what is my reward then? Verily that, truly that, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I've used not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, they're accusing Paul of things like benefiting or profiting by the gospel. And he's preached the gospel to them at his own expense. And he's done so in such a way that he's persecuted and ultimately dies for it. And he's saying, I want to make it so that people understand I'm not in this because it benefits me to preach the gospel. It's because it's true. Now here's what I want to come to. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Paul is a Roman citizen. He has freedom and benefits as a Roman citizen. Paul is free in Jesus Christ. He's not even under the law as a Jew. He's free from all men. There's no one that can make Paul do anything, but he is everyone's servant because of the gospel. Under the Jews, became, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. Why did Paul shave his head and take a vow when he went to Jerusalem? He wanted to let the Jews know, I'm not against God's law. I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to undermine or oppose God's law, but Jesus Christ is the fulfilling of the law. Uh, to them that are without law, as without law. He's not preaching Jewish gospel in Athens. He's not preaching to them the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of Moses. No, he says he's the God of creation, and in him we live and move and have our being. To the, them that are without the law as without law, not being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. You understand? That I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. And here Paul's saying, we're the same. In Jesus Christ, we're the same. He put it in, is it in uh, Colossians, where he says, uh, in Christ Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. Paul was an educated man to the educated people. To the philosophers, Paul, Paul quoted philosophers so they know, I know where you're coming from, I know you're philosophers. By the way, Christian, educate yourself. Educate yourself up and educate yourself down. What do you mean? You need to be able to talk to uneducated people. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't relate to them. They, I just can't relate to being... I, I understand that. It's a little tough sometimes. You've got to figure out what they think. And sometimes it's as complicated figuring out what uneducated people think as is figuring out what educated people think. But you know who oughtn't to, to be uneducated about people in general and unable to relate to people? Believers. Well, pastor, you know, I just... Intellectuals, you know, I just can't relate to them. Well, maybe not naturally, but you can. Uh, well, pastor, educated people, I can't relate to. Well, get educated. Uh, you ought to know something about everything. You're the kind of narrow-minded person that says, well, that's not my field of expertise. Gain some expertise in a field. 
learn something that takes you out of your comfort zone because of people that are valuable to Jesus. And Paul said, I am free from all men, but I came a servant of all. You know everyone likes a servant. Anyone will let you do something for them. And so, build that with people. And what Paul did was challenged the Gospel. The end of it is that a man became a believer. Of course, there were several ladies that were believers. Uh, the end of it is that at Athens, a number of people got saved. And so many of them said, we're going to hear you on this matter again. And many of them became believers, but many also didn't believe. And that's the way preaching the Gospel is. Let's take... Let's just take a side note here. If your concern is unpopularity, or your concern is, oh, I failed, I, I made the person angry with what I said. Well, look at ways that you cannot make people angry if possible. But when you challenge somebody's faith, if they're not willing to be open-minded, they're going to be angry. And your alternative is to just let them go to hell unchallenged. Nobody is standing in the way. Nobody to stand in the gaps. Nobody to try to stop them and help them. On the other hand, being obnoxious will get you nowhere. You don't need to stand in the street corners and scream to people that you've never met that they're going to hell because you don't know if they're going to hell or not. So as a believer, we need to take some of these caveats, some of these challenges. You say, Pastor, how do I win my unsaved lost friend? Figure out what they believe. Find out what they believe. You don't know what they even believe. They, you're not going to be able to reach them. You can't relate to them. They say, you don't even know what I believe. How can you tell me I'm wrong? Now, it doesn't mean they're right just because they... And some people think they're right just because they know something no one else knows. So they just make up things to know. <laughs> you know, uh, Theologically, there are a lot of people that like to play that game. Well, have you ever read this author? I can't possibly read every author. Go to the library sometime. Look how many books there are and try to figure out if you could read one floor in your lifetime if that's all you ever did. You can't know everything, but when you're reaching a person, you can know what you need to to know what they're thinking. So I'll read a stupid book sometimes. <laughs> I said stupid. My wife has got kids distracting her. She doesn't know I said it. Uh, but I'll read something that I don't agree with completely sometime. Why? Well, so that people can know. Uh, what I believe, or so I can know what they believe and relate to them. Alright, so I hope that gives you some some uh, points from the example of the Apostle Paul. Alright? Father, thank you for what we've learned today. We do ask that you would just help us with our thinking and our understanding so that we could be effective in winning lost religious people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. We'll start service on time. What was that building up on top of the hill? Well, there's the Oropagus, and then there is...